everybody back here on Siegel Talks at the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center CUNY in Manhattan, New York City at the City University. And um, it's again another day on uh, planet Earth and it's a Friday and we are um, uh, finishing week 16 of our um, Siegel Talks where we talk to theater artists from New York, from the US and all around the globe from all continents. I think we had a over 120 artists we talk to now and um, it has been uh, quite uh, quite stunning to hear all these different experiences how they <clears throat> experienced that moment of corona the time of corona we had Tiago Rodriguez yesterday from Portugal who runs the National Theatre who had to close it open it up then had to close it again last Monday because of one case 150 artists had to be tested and collaborators, but everybody was fine. So they are opening, reopening today. And he says how complicated, how difficult it is. We heard from Susanna Kennedy from Berlin and uh, about her um, uh, journey she is uh, going through and how she's rethinking her work. And from so, so uh, many, many, many others. In uh, America, it is still bleak compared to what we hear from, uh, from Europe. Susanna said her show opened again. Uh, uh, with restrictions and with only partial seating. Uh, also, Tiago's uh, work um, was shown um, again, and they're all very careful. They have access to fast testing. Um, here we have 76,000 infections yesterday. It's the double amount, what used to be the norm, 30, 35,000, and it will go up at least to 100,000. Um, that's what people uh, suggest. It's a, it is stunning. It is against uh, what New York City experience we had. I think around uh, in April, we had 800 deaths in one day. This is a terrible thing even to think about. And uh, actually five days ago at Bloomberg News report, there was not one Corona death in New York City. So we are doing something right here. And that uh, uh, rejection to wear a mask, uh, which uh, some governors even imposing on cities were mayor say people wear a mask and they say no it's uh, it's shocking that's how it's politicized that if you're for trump you don't wear a mask if you're against trump you wear one it's not the case uh, so it's it's shocking and um and it's a good thing that we have artists uh, with us who can help us to make some meaning out of this time um, where we we live in it's uh, a time of profound confusion of uh, shaking uh, everything, what we do, what we think about, what we feel is essential. And uh, and if we ever said we needed some time to think things through, this is now. If you want to change it, it's now. Uh, things have to change. Also, now it's the time to prepare for it. Like Virginia Barber said, the moment before you shoot the arrow, this is the one that is important. And this is the moment now where we prepare this incubation time, as Susanna Kennedy said. With us today, we have a, a, a force uh, in American theater. We have uh, the great Caridad uh, Switch uh, with us. Caridad, welcome. Hello. And welcome back to the Seagulls that you have been with us uh, so many, many times. I and have, uh, have. and uh, Caridad is uh, the 2012 OB Lifetime Achievement Award winner, and she got also the ATCA prize, Primus Prize for her House of the Spirits, which she adapted, Isabel Allende's novel. It's a great, great work she did. Her works, uh, Red Bike and uh, Guapa, are now performing, or they're going around, or were prepared um, to be uh, performed. Um, her place and performance text in English and Spanish focus on human and environmental rights, gender fluidity, incantatory speech acts and hybridity. And she also wrote some books, uh, 50 playwrights on their craft, uh, Mitchell and Trask, Hed Hedwig and the Angry Age, and many, many others. She is uh, uh, on the editorial board of Rutledge, where she also write the books for on the Contemporary Theater Review. And also, as which I didn't know, her first uh, feature film uh, based on her work will come out, Fugitive Dreams, with Mattis and, and April Mattis and Scott Shepard. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it will come out on 2020, which is this year in the Fantasia International Film Festival in Montreal. Um, but uh, most of all, Caridad um, has been uh, next to her great work in writing in translation. She's a brilliant translator and adapter. Um, she has been also an organizer, um, a community organizer, as Obama would say. She created the No Passport. Uh, movement, conferences, symposia, where so, so many people got together, learned about each other. So she created a network that has been significant. And um, so she has been in contact over many, many years or decades with um, 
with the scene with Latinx scene and but of course also with American theater and um, so it's a great to have you with us Caridad. Sorry for my lengthy introduction. We do have international viewers who might not know all about you so uh, so uh, where are you and um, if you are not in New York, what time is it? I am in New York so I think I'm on I'm on the same time as you are. Uh, yeah. So and, what's uh, going on? How, how do you experience this moment? Oh my gosh. Uh, well, many things, you know, as I'm sure some, some people may have been in the same uh, boat I was in terms of teaching. So I, uh, in the middle of March, suddenly it was like, turn everything online. It was, I was right in the middle of spring break and I had to, <laughs> as with many of my colleagues, kind of rethink the entire, the rest of the semester. Also holding a lot of traumatic space uh, for my students and myself and my peers, uh, while also trying to uh, navigate uh, faith in artistry. And you know why? You know I think I think that this is a moment where I think some people are like, why should I write anything? <laughs> why should I make any art? <laughs> what does it matter? And I think that you know what I've been finding. Uh, especially from students has been like a desire to maybe as a means of escape, but, but a desire to actually articulate yeah, and not necessarily articulate stories that are about, you know, one-on-one -on -one, minimetically about uh, this time, but, but more about fears and doubts and dreams that they're having. So, so I think that it's been an interesting time. Sorry, I'm going to do my nose for just a second. This is live, mm -hmm. so it's cool. Yay! Uh, and uh, it's not it's the not corona the, sneeze. It's not the corona. It's not the corona. No, but I have like a little allergy. I have allergies, so that's been like kind of maximized by all of this that's happening in the world. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, and I just feel like there's also been. I mean, obviously, we're in a an interesting time of reckoning. Uh, in culture, both through through the pandemic and what it's exposed in terms of fault lines, which I think have always been there. You know, I, I think it's fascinating that people are like, oh my God, I didn't know like the theater world was so hierarchical and and so and there was so much disparity economically. And I'm like, yeah, it's always been there. Uh, uh, but so it's interesting that the you know there's some uh, reawakening our awareness of that, but also around BLM and 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 how that's so so galvanized. Uh, looking at institutional practices and systemic racism and um, theater specifically, uh, but also globally and around other systems uh, culturally. And so I just think that we're in a fascinating moment of, there's that word called pivot, which I don't like very much, but I will use it for now, uh, of a pivot moment. But I also think I worry a little bit that if you look at history, you know, uh, it's one step forward, two steps back. So I, I also have this fear that it will be like, oh yes, this is a moment of reckoning. And then, you know, in six months time, people are like, well, that's done. <laughs> and we go back to the normal, you know what I mean? And I, and I think that actually uh, there is, I, I fear that that desire to go back to a, a prior moment, uh, pre-reckoning, um, might be a moment of great damage. So, so I'm in terms of discussions and conversations and awarenesses that have occurred. But on the other side of all of this is here we are on Zoom, uh, and I'm you know I've always been a big a big advocate for digital theater since about the year 2000, transmedia work especially. And uh, so I feel like. Um, the rediscovery, or for for a lot of people, or or the new the new discovery of oh, this is a medium that can also be theater, <laughs> and what does that mean? Um, uh, I think has been really exciting, and I think a lot of in innovative work uh, has been happening around trying to figure out what what can make this a live experience, as we're having now, or if it's pre-recorded, how can it capture the idea of immediacy and liveness? So testing the notion of liveness in this medium. So I find like that's too really exciting. It's also pointed to moments of accessibility for people that have never been able to afford to go to like see a show, like suddenly it's in their house and they can download it or they can view it. Uh, and I think that's that's found a new audience, you know, for, for the community. And, I, and I, I hope that that continues. Like I think my other worry about who knows how long it's gonna last, but let's say, let's do the six month model for just a second. 
or maybe it's like the nine month model, I would say, especially in the US, I would say that uh, what, I, what I dream of is that uh, physical, physical b building based theaters uh, also sustain uh, parallel digital programming um, so that we don't lose the audiences that have actually found solace and comfort and have also new audiences that have come to theater spaces that would normally would not have been accessible to them for physical reasons, but also for economic ones. Mm. How did you do? How did you do at the time? And were you in your apartment in New York? How did, how did you experience it? Oh, um... I've been writing like crazy. I mean, I think the funny thing for writers is that this is sort of our norm, sort of our normal. Like we're used to like just being hunkered down and working and facing our screens. Um, so, so a part of that is familiar in a sense. Uh, I think that there's been for me, like I wrote, I had two big projects that I had to work on. So I had deadlines. And so that was really helpful in terms of my own process. I was like, well, I've got to do this one by this date and I will do it. Um, and then I found myself with like loads of time to do the work. <laughs> and I was like, oh, now that's done, check. First draft done of this that I have to turn in, the second draft done of this that I've turned in. And then I wrote two other things and I've been like, I never wrote a chapter for a book on Simon Stevens work that's coming out with uh, Rutledge uh, later in the year. And like, so I've been doing all sorts of writing, audio pieces and digital pieces. Um, so it's been flourishing, but I've also been a little bit uh, wondering like, what's the, you know, I I tweeted the other day, <laughs> I'm very active on Twitter, but uh, I tweeted the other day about, oh, I feel like we're on shifting sand. And I feel like for, for freelance artists, especially that's precarious and the extreme. The other part of that is that in, just in terms of the industry and the field, um, you don't know, like most people are being furloughed or are being let go, right? So, so all the contacts or all the people that you sort of normally used to talk to are now no longer in those positions. And so you're like, well, what's the field gonna look like in nine months time or 12 months time? And who <clears> will be in those positions and which theaters will survive? So I think that part of it, from a practitioner's perspective is really scary um, because you sort of don't know like where your community will be uh, and, and who's gonna make it through. But what I've been finding um, is that small, like what I call smaller, lower budget theater companies have just been to me like incredibly inspiring, like really taking the reins and going, if we're gonna do it on Twitch, you know, we're gonna do it on that platform. If we're gonna, like figure out how to do it like with $3, we're gonna make it, you know? So I feel like there's um, that sense of resiliency and resourcefulness that scrappy small, as people say, um, which is not an easy road to, to have companies, by the way. But I feel are, like that's been, that's been very inspiring for me. Which companies or artists did you, did you, did do you mean by these? Yeah, so yeah, the, there's a company in Cincinnati called No Theater, K-N-O-W, uh, and they've just, uh, they, they were like very early, maybe around, right when this hit, to us anyway, uh, in terms of shutdown around mid-March. Um, the first, I got an email from them and they were like, we're putting our stuff online. You know what I mean? They were gonna, we have productions that we archive that we're gonna stream and we're gonna ticket them. And we're, they had a plan, like they had a plan like the next day, <laughs> uh, which I thought was remarkable. Um, when other people were like, I don't know what I'm gonna do and maybe won't do anything and maybe we wait. They were like, we're taking action. In fact, they've actually decided they're gonna do a season next year and it probably will be an all digital season or some combination of digital and audio. Um, so they're not relinquishing the idea of doing a season. So they've been amazing. Women's Theater Festival in North Carolina, small, small, super scrappy, um, approached me also around the same time, right when this all hit, and they were like, we're doing stuff on Twitch. We're gonna do readings, we're gonna do digital productions, we're gonna somehow make it happen. We're gonna pay our artists, even if it's like $5, we're gonna pay them. <laughs> um, yeah, and feeling like the, out of out of you know extremely precarious and unsettling circumstances rising to the occasion uh and and i find that um remarkable uh and exciting um 
And also I feel like there's real leadership, strangely enough, at places where, and in communities where I think maybe are not as visible in terms of mainstream press or, or national press, but are actually doing um, really strong work, one, to sustain their audience base, uh, and to, to expand their audience space as well by, by connecting in the digital platform. Mm. So how is your community doing? How is the No Passport community? The Nopers, what yeah. Hear? What do you hear from everyone? What do I hear from everyone? I think a lot of fear and a lot of doubt and a lot of unsettledness. I think uh, we're still publishing. So uh, I'm in the middle of copy editing a new volume right now and preparing two more volumes for the fall. So, so that part of what we do is still active and, and you know, it's a little bit slower because I'm having to do everything <laughs> myself, um, but, uh, but that's okay. And, uh, so you and I design just, the books, you do all of it. And I do everything. I do the whole thing. Yeah, so it's like uh, hours and hours of hours of work, but it's for love, right? So, so it's great. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, and then I'm, I think people have just been expressing fear and doubt. I think a lot of people are thinking about leaving the theater entirely. Uh, feeling like the field is not there for them anymore, uh, feeling disconnected. Uh, and so I think that those fears are genuine and I, and I wanna respect them. And I don't think this is a gonna, I think we're gonna have a lot of attrition in the field and that's gonna be tough when we come through this, especially in the United States um, to see what's on the other side of this in terms of who, who's still standing in a way. And I, I don't think our government's helping, you know, so, no. so in any way. Uh, so I think it's also exposed the fact that, you know, the fact that we don't have subsidy like other countries, is, you know, is, but it's so clear and, and, uh, and there's no plan. There's, there's no plan to begin with in terms of handling, handling the virus, let alone a plan to, to save the art sector and to figure out mm -hmm how to sustain freelancers and, and, and people in administration and, and the related industries around the arts uh, to survive. So I, 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 think, I think the fears, uh, the, the conversations around No Passport have been around a lot of them about economic inequity and also about will, will it be, will this be a time when we'll lose like a great percentage of our theater companies and, and it'll be, be 10 people left standing. And those 10 people may be the people with the biggest budgets that can have, that have some reserves uh, that can weather this. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a real concern and not one to be taken lightly. Hmm. Well, what do you say to someone when they said, I think we we're gonna close down? What do you say to someone? Oh Lord, you know. I mean, I do you that, talk about it, or is it? Um, do you, do you talk to artists then, or theater companies? Do they ask you? Or? Yeah, yeah. I think that the conversations have been around. I mean, especially talking to artists, the conversations have been around. Um, a is this a time to? A rethink about the work that we make. So one of that, what part of that is embracing the digital media and the other part of that is, um, are there, you know, a lot of, a lot of the people that I'm talking to are, are moving or wanting to move into VR, uh, virtual reality platforms and feeling like that might be an answer in some way uh, to rethinking how they make work. Um, and so that's been sort of an interesting side, side conversation that's been happening around the artists that I've been speaking with. Um, the other conversations have been around getting back to um, really the, what I, you know, super old school, you know, we have a wagon and we put it in the middle of the field and, and we do theater that way, uh, like super low budget, uh, super mobile, um, bringing theater into communities in that way. Um, observing all the guidelines that need to be observed and trying to figure that out. Um, so that's been interesting. I've been talking to some designers around, uh, spoke to a designer yesterday, uh, Robert Mark Morgan, who's uh, based in uh, St. Louis and, and he has been designing a wagon theater that, that, can, that can make pop-up theater happen in communities. And, and we were talking about, oh, how can, 
why isn't everybody doing it? You know, like this is a way, right? If we know that outdoor spaces are safer, is there is a way mm -hmm. to do that? Um, and and also to um, slung low uh, across the pond uh, up in Leeds uh, in the UK, who've been doing extraordinary work around uh, community building, but also turning their theater space, turning their pub, basically, they have a pub space, turning it into a, a space that feeds feeds their community that has like a mm -hmm. local food bank uh, and that also presents performances socially distanced like on wagons but also with their audience intents and like there's just so many ways of thinking about what we do that might not be this quote business as usual but actually goes back to the roots of of what this form can do uh, so I'm excited by that uh, and excited too about how we rethink the kinds of works that we see, um, who, who's in the driver's seat in terms of programming and also how can we dream again? You know, I feel like right now what I'm hearing from a lot of artists, particularly as sort of theater makers and writers and is there's a, should we be writing about Corona right now? Do you know what I mean? Like there's a, there's a, our jobs as writers usually is we're responding to what's happening in the world and we're kind of making work. And, it, and but it also feels like writing about, most of the people that I know have been saying, I don't want to write about this time. Like, I don't want to write about people wearing masks. I don't want to write about, people. you know, like there's a, there's a, a, a it's too traumatic. And, and, but at the same time, the rules are changing about how, how do you, like I was like writing a piece the other day and talking to another colleague and we were talking about how do we stage intimacy? Uh, how do we write intimacy, let alone stage it uh, when we're creating a piece of work uh, for theater and that, that it changes the rules around that. And I think that abiding by this, the same rules doesn't really fly, you know what I mean? So. So I love the challenge of that. I love the restriction of that as an artist personally, but I, but I also think it's rethinking everything. Um, and also what's safe for performers and, and, and making sure that people are taken care of. And I think that, uh, I know that a lot of the conversations at least publicly have been around audiences, but I think that we're not talking a lot about how performers can be safe uh, in, in, in new performing environments. And, and, and I worry a little bit that we're not taking that into account, um, especially when people are desperate for work uh, and you know the whole industry has sort of shut down around them and, and, and the idea of like wanting to work again is so tempting. Uh, but I think that we have to really take care of each other at this time in terms of the, not just the CDC guidelines, but also just making sure people are, again, we're, we're all suffering from tremendous social trauma, um, which is impacting not only what we make, but how we present ourselves. So, uh, and how we interact with others, uh, even when we're, we're trying to make art. Uh, so, so I think acknowledging that is really important, um, despite the rush and desire to, to kind of make work uh, uh, somehow uh, at this time. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, of course. Mm. And what about you? Do you do? Are you rethinking what you believe in theater? About what you the the foundation, the essentials, the um, the why, the why. what and where, and I, I, or do you do you think I'm just wait till it's over? I I publish, I write, and then we go back. Um, Right. No, I don't think so. I mean, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a waiting person anyway. <laughs> I, that's not my mode. Uh, so uh, uh, in, in everyday circumstances, I tend to be a patient and kind of, I think sometimes in a good way and sometimes in a bad way, but uh, uh, just wanting to get to kind of stay connected and do the work. Uh, I think that rethinking the work has been around uh, I'm thinking a lot formally about what the work looks like. I mean, I've, I always think about that, but I think that more now. Um, and and because of I said for the last oh gosh, um, ten years, I've just been really thinking about uh, uh, the relationship to the audience and audience engagement, and in a very direct way. And um, 
how do you create spaces for audiences to to be with you, um, to be witness, but also to interact and what are safe spaces in which that can happen. So I've, I've just been thinking a lot about creating um, installation theater and also um, what I call conversation theater. So, so that's been at the forefront of my mind uh, mm -hmm. a lot. And on the, si on the sidebar of that, which is maybe not a sidebar, but going back to as a writer, going back to stuff that I was thinking about, you know, when I first started writing, <laughs> when I did, I know I was writing for theater and, uh, and, and writing things that maybe look more like poetry or that, that could live in different mediums. So I think what it's, what's been exciting for me is to think about how can I make something that can live as audio live or digital? How can I create work that sort of can accommodate three different kinds of platforms potentially uh, and still retain its integrity somehow. Um, so I'm, that's been like a really, just on a formal level, that may seem like a really simple thing, but I feel like that's been for me, like personally really exciting uh, to figure out like the strategy around that, to go like, oh my God, how can I, this could be really cool. And, uh, and, and then to see it mutate. So I think that one of the exciting things around some of the work that's been streaming of mine, like Red Bikes, archival recording was streaming, but uh, there's a small company in Santa Fe New Mexico that's starting to stream, um, did a video performance of my play Red Bike that's starting to stream today uh, and it runs through the end of the month. Uh, and that play is originally structured to accommodate one, two, three, four, five actors. How many, how many, many people want to be a part of it? Uh, and and it's, you know, it can be any generation and it can be, you know, it can sort of is inflected by the performers that walk into it. Um, and in Santa Fe, they're doing it with 10 actors uh, across generations uh, and across ethnicities and across race. Um, and I'm tremendously excited. And they also did like a video rendering of the play. So, so which is uh, super, again, super small company, just trying to make work happen. And that to me has been very exciting because it's made me rethink about how language, since I'm primarily work with words <laughs> as a writer, uh, uh, how, how does language function in different mediums? And, and I think what I find about this medium, particularly the sort of Zoom stage or the digital stage, is that I've been finding that I'm attracted as a practitioner to its possibility for immediacy and intimacy. Intimacy like relationship to the viewer, um, maybe because of the, the camera. Uh, and then, uh, that, it, that it puts me, I think, closer to the material, but I think then the language has to carry through the screen um, in a different way than it would on stage. So I'm, I'm finding just on a technical level that to be such a ripe and uh, thrilling ride for me as a writer uh, and I'm eager to see what comes of it. Like as I've been making things in this time period, um, I made one thing that was like a throwback, you know, that I was sort of like, well, this is, this is sort of a play that like harkens to the past and now I wanna write for the future. And I think, yeah, so I'm really interested in that. And I'm also thinking about how do we stage globalization when borders are closed and how do we interact with international artists. Uh, this platform is one of the few where that can happen. So, so it's, it's bypassing <laughs> uh, a lot of border controls uh, to be in the digital environment. And I find that tremendously exciting. And mm -hmm. also thinking a lot about multilinguality and thinking a lot about uh, oral dramaturgy, A-U-R-A-L, um, and how that can inflect this medium. Mm -hmm. so you mentioned theater of conversation. What's that? Yeah, I've been thinking about uh, plays that function like conversations with the audience, um, that the structure of them is um, embedded around questions and, and room for answers from the audience, but also that those answers get incorporated into the text um, in a digital platform that might function really well over chat, I suppose, the chat window. Uh, the, but also that the structure of the play resembles a conversation so that it's not that we're following an ostensible plot or a, but we're following how a movement of movements of thoughts and how 
how we can interact. So if, if I'm talking to the audience or if a group of actors is just with an audience, that that movement of thought is shared. Um, so yeah, so I've been, I've been kind of, it started actually with a play I made in 20, oh gosh, when was it? Uh, 2015. I started working on this play called Town Hall, which was structured as sort of forum theater. And, and I've, we've been, I've been working on it ever since. And that play sort of has led to other plays. So, and in fact, it was going to have a, a kind of staging, workshop staging at the Tate Modern when COVID hit. So uh, in association with Royal Holloway Drama. So, so then we did a, like a festival version online uh, of it. Um, but I've, that's, I've been kind of investigating that notion of interactivity that mm -hmm. feels, um, uh, that affects how the piece is built uh, as well as how it's presented. Uh, I'm just really interested in, in how an audience can be empowered uh, in a theater experience and, and at the same time feel safe uh, I think what, what happens sometimes in interactivity is that you're like forced to do things and I'm definitely not interested in that, uh, but I am interested in spaces that allow for reflection and contemplation, which means going against sometimes uh, things that, that we know of as structure, at least in more conventional settings around uh, rising action and so forth. It's, I'm sort of going against that. And I'm also really interested in decentering the human and thinking about how we contend with because you know we're still in climate change you know so i don't know like that hasn't gone away <laughs> so yeah. i feel like uh how do we write work and make work um that is and bring it into being that decentrist human and actually talks about relationship to the planet and and talks about relationship to humans and animals and insects and water and air and so forth and 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 looking at systems that we're a part of and i think that that is something, that's a space um, that I'm deeply, deeply, deeply invested and interested in and, and want to keep plowing that furrow as it were. Mm -hmm. So you're investigating how writing online that is in an open discourse, dialogue, conversation with the audience as a democratization of um, participatory, socially engaged art. Yes. Have you done Absolutely. a work like this? Or have you put one out or? Sorry? Have you, have you tried things out? Have you done that or? Have you tried things? I think we tried, we tried a little bit with Town Hall when we did the Festival Interrupted um, mm -hmm. version for Royal Holloway Drama. Uh, I'm working on a piece right How now. Go? How did it go with the audience? It was great. It was super exciting and um, Sorry, I'm just gonna do my nose again. <laughs> it's not COVID, I swear. Um, uh, um, the um, it was great. It was a the students had been working on the play for about a year, in the class. So so they were deep, deep, really deeply in it, and the faculty person, a director named Rebecca McCutcheon, had been working with me on it for a while. So we had done a workshop of it at the Camden People's Theatre in London last summer as part of the Calm Down Deer Festival. So, so, so it was kind of like a, the next stage actually in our development with the piece. Um, and and I, think, I think one of the things that I think we discovered in this interrupted version, uh, because we couldn't get to do it at the Tate is that um, there was the, I feel like we needed more space for the audience. Like I, it was sort of interesting because it was like, oh, actually we need, I want to relook at the piece again and think about how we can create more openings uh, in the piece for uh, for engagement and reflection uh, and more breathing space, especially uh, so and moments of silence um, and moments of ritual. So so that's that's kind of fun to be kind of testing it out in different formats. Uh, I think one of the things we also talked about is maybe there's an element of that piece specifically that functions a little bit like breakout rooms so that maybe that's, um, you know, maybe we meet as, as a group and an initial, like the initial scene, first scene or two scenes, and then we actually go into breakout rooms with it and then come back. I felt like there's something in the energy of that that I'm really excited about. Um, so that's happening. And then, you know, alongside all of this, you know, sort of being re-energized and reawakened and hopefully, uh, 
coming through this, I've had three world premieres canceled and, you know, so, so I've also been negotiating mentally how to, how to deal with work that suddenly has evaporated basically each of them sort of five years of work that have just now like are in limbo. Uh, and so I've been like, oh, you know, that was going to happen. That was going to happen and that was going to happen. Now those three things are not going to happen right now. Uh, so as a maker, how do I, how do I mentally adjust to that and look at these pieces that we're going to premiere that are, that I look at now with, with uh, forlornment and uh, melancholy, <laughs> you know what I mean? Because then now they're tainted by this experience. So I've, I've also been just on a personal level dealing with that and trying to figure out um, what do, you know, how do those, how will those pieces live again? And if so, how they're going to live again? And, and what will that mean? You know, if we're truly back in some live form in 2021, May or, or June, what's that going to look like? And, and how, how, how are those works going to resonate? Because they were made, they've been building for five years and I've been, they were going to premiere this year. So, and that's, it's going to be a different world, right? So I, so I've also been thinking about that, to be honest. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that means uh, it's almost like a research and development and it will not see the light of the day, like, you know. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, maybe, <laughs> like, yeah. I have no idea, well, you know, it's like really form, crazy. In the form, as you said, that it was um, conceived, yes. the context changes. Joan Bass, yes. the great singer said, she said, you know, I sing my song, it's the same songs, but the context yeah. changed. It was, I was yes. singing in Woodstock. It was something completely different and I said, I sing it now and she was funny. She said, uh, I started out with friends and family, then little clubs, larger clubs, big venues, stadiums, and then slowly went back from stadiums to larger clubs, to smaller clubs. <laughs> smaller, smaller clubs. She said, I'm back to family now and I feel maybe it's a bit uh, with theater too, but there is something um, of course to it. How was that moment, I mean, for the Latinx uh, community where you are a leader, where you are an activist, where you're someone who has made a real change and gave voice to, to a movement? How, how is the Black Lives Matter, the BLM, how, how, how does it fit in for you? What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I think the Latinx community that field, I mean, we, this was a, you know, it's funny, we, there was this season uh, nationally uh, was going to see, I think, the most premieres of Latinx work around the country than there has been in a long time. So, and that's suddenly all gone. Uh, Some of those. Do you, uh, can you let us know? Uh, Some of them that come to my, I don't have the full list in front yeah, of me, but, uh, co you know, Copper Children at OSF by Karen Zacarias, which is now streaming for, for till July 22nd. They were able to capture one of the last Performance before the shutdown, Torera by Monet Hurst Mendoza at Long Wharf, you know, was canceled, postponed. The Kilroy's just put up the whole list of, especially work by women. Um, uh, you know, so there's just been like, you know, Isaac Gomez. I mean, it's just so many artists. And it feels like, you know, Brian Herrera at Princeton University talks about the lost season of Latinx theater. And, and this is one of them. The lost, the lost season? season of Latinx uh, theater. Yeah, I talked to Brian. Yeah, and he's been making a Google Doc of, of all the plays and all the kind of performance work that was going to pre basically premiere, a lot of them from young, early career artists. So it was going to get their first shot, um, which is like really important. I think that especially if I can't imagine, you know, just imagine being a young artist now or a young artist coming out of college and going, doing your first big show or doing your first semi big show. and and then their field shuts down and they're like, now what, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I feel like finding the faith for especially uh, early career artists right now, I think is, and mentoring those folks has been really important. I think that uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and uh, has galvanized sort of everyone uh, to, 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 re, to recalibrate um, where where we are and, and and where in heck are we going and what kind of what kind of field do we want to be in and how can we affect change? I feel like the culturally specific organizations, um, especially in the Latinx theater movement, which tend to be smaller budget, 
much more precarious in terms of how they can make it through right now, if at all. Um, I just worry about them the most. And I think most of the, our colleagues in the field worry about as well, because I feel like it's one thing to say, um, just as an example, you know, I think it's one thing to say, oh, Long Wharf will probably survive. <laughs> but maybe Milagro Theater in Portland, Oregon may not. Do you know what I mean? Like, because of just economics, right? So, but actually Milagro is like one of the few sort of theaters that are doing incredible work in Portland, Oregon for the Latinx community and for the national Latinx community. So it feels like those venues like Caramilla in Dallas, Milagro in Portland, um, Teatro Vision, Teatro Paraguas. There's so many, Repertorio in New York, you know, who's been shut down uh, and are streaming, thank God, some work and, and doing readings and so forth. But I feel like those organizations are suddenly in a chokehold uh, a little bit about how to move forward. And they'll say they don't have the infrastructure to suddenly go digital and suddenly have all the tech and suddenly, you know, and so it, it, it's a little bit like an unmooring. Um, and I, uh, I think there's just a lot of concern and I know, but the concern is also like, let's save these theaters, right? Let's say, let's try to save uh, these theaters that are, that have been embedded in community for a long time and have actually been uh, supporting Latinx artists for years, um, sort of, sometimes against the tide, right? Uh, so, so I think there's a, a, an interesting reckoning with what are our spaces and how do we take care of those spaces uh, and not take them for granted um, and lift them up, you know? So I think, you know, I feel like the, the process of lifting up those spaces has become really important uh, uh, in an effort to, to try to get them through. Uh, and also, you know, knowing that we're all uh, looking at systems of inequity and institutional racism that affects across the board and trying to figure out how the structures themselves at the core have to be rethought. Um, and I think that, that, you know, conversations that are happening around, you know, should it be an artistic director model? Like, are there, there are other models, you know, there's collectives, there's cooperatives, there's different ways of running a theater. Uh, and, I, and I think that it, maybe this is the time, you know, I hope um, for that to occur uh, and to kind of rethink how the entire structural model is put together um, of most of, most of the theater companies in the United States. Um, especially. So, so yes, and I think there's also been interesting, maybe I would call not side conversations, but uh, a rethinking around Afro-Latinx uh, artists and Afro-Latinx voices, uh, which in the, which in the Latinx community, I, you know, have been not as visible you know, there has been uh, colorism and racism that's been very active in Latinx community. So I think that we have to reckon with that and deal with that. And, um, and, it's, and it's starting to happen, thank God, you know? So, but yeah, but that's, that's becoming sort of slowly at the forefront of conversations and also thinking about funding and thinking about how do we empower uh, Afro-Latinx artists and, and empower the Afro-Latinx identities uh, mm. to make work. Mm. And, um, and to, uh, so you fear also for your community that there will be a lot of the theaters will close, artists will leave, and then that the community that already has been disadvantaged over centuries, once yeah. again, will, will carry a burden and will suffer and will not get uh, the same funding the British, the well-made British play will get. Right, and, yeah. And, or do you have a hope that this moment is, as you said, pivoting, is it's a change, something revolves, a re revolutionary, something is changing. What, what, is your, what is your feeling about this moment? My feeling about this moment is uh, multifaceted, but what I will say to quote Alan Reed uh, is we need to evacuate the building, <laughs> just evacuate the building and start working in non-buildings and start thinking about our people and start thinking about the people in our arts uh, who are suffering and have, have been suffering for a long time in terms of economic inequity. 
a lot of our gig workers, as we are called, they're freelancers uh, who have no sustainable anything, no nets, um, healthcare, no nets around jobs, no nets around anything, to actually figure out systems that can um, empower us, you know, whether it be through some sort of as other countries have or are starting to have universal basic income for artists, um, that that is actually a viable thing to fight for. Uh, I think that, but I, I, you know, it may not be fashionable to think, to say evacuate the building, but I do think that's sort of the answer, <laughs> the answer because when you're, when you're um, not tied to the edifice, when you're not tied to real estate uh, and are looking at the people are what make the art, uh, it's really looking at how do you sustain the organism, the ecology of the humans um, that are making the work uh, and that are trying to make the work and are developing work and are researching work, you know, and are sometimes are spending 10 years or five years or seven years just developing a project. Um, uh, and I, so I think that for me, it's about the liberation, the revolution is in re liberation from uh, physical structures actually, uh, with, with, no, with no dissing of physical structures, however beautiful they may be. On the other side of my sort of thinking around that is, which may seem paradoxical, but just hold, hold this thought for a moment, which is collaborating with architects, <laughs> collaborating with architects to, th to rethink if we're gonna make physical structures, new physical structures, what are they gonna look like? What's more equitable? And maybe this notion of like, let's pack them in, and let's, you know, that that's actually not gonna be the answer anymore, certainly. So I feel like we need to rethink what our physical spaces look like uh, and how they function uh, and new ways of thinking how we make theater. Um, and, and I think collaborating with architects is one of them. So, so as, there, as is happening in, you know, in other countries. So I feel like, so, two, so my two strands are, are antithetical, but I think we're related. One is evacuate the building. And if you're gonna make another building, make a different kind of building. Uh, and the other, the other and more foremost at the forefront of all of this is take care of your workforce, uh, take care of your cultural workers who are actually doing the deep listening, the deep collective listening around culture that are, that are through trauma uh, and that are, that are maybe, maybe be our visionaries and maybe the ones that can hold us together uh, through all times. And so, and I feel that really passionately, really strongly. Um, so, yeah. So you, you feel the structures we have will not work. It's hopeless. No. Or build new ones. There, I think it's been broken for a long time. So <laughs> I'm not like, you know, I've said this in print. I've said this on books. I've, you know, I've been saying it for years. You know, it's been broken for a very long time and it just needs to like, and, and I think that, and I think small repairs and small band-aid repairs don't work. Uh, they're cosmetic and they're also performative gestures. So I think that, that actually it's really about, you know, restructuring everything. But are we in a culture that's gonna allow for that? I'm not sure uh, because we're so tied to capitalism. So I'm not sure. Uh, so maybe it'll be small things that occur, you know what I mean? Maybe small versions of restructuring everything. Uh, and then there'll be things that will always remain the same, uh, sadly. So, um, but it's the nature of, it's the nature of the culture we're in. Uh, so I think it's also acknowledging that we can't overturn, um, uh, capitalist structures overnight. Mm -hmm. And how is the support for you? I mean, you are, you know, some of the role models in the Latinx uh, community. You publish, you write, uh, you uh, uh, adapt. Um, how, where, where do you, for no passport, uh, where, where, does, where does the support come from? Where's, what support do you get? What support do, do the theaters get? You know, Ralph Pena and other, where does it come from? Is there a Latin-based community that supports you? Is it the city? Is it donors? How, how is it even even um, funded. Oh Lord, I, my credit card is helping. <laughs> I'm being funded by my credit card. And uh, no, I mean, I've been getting, uh, I've been, you know, I've, I've personally gotten as an artist, uh, some COVID relief um, through, through the Brett Adams Foundation because of my show got canceled in, in West Virginia. And I luckily was, was got some money from them and, um, Foundation for Contemporary Art uh, uh, has also uh, kindly uh, 
uh, giving me some money to, to weather this. I've also also been the benefactor of, you know, this is what I mean about artists. Like Bryony Kimmings in the UK did this thing called Gig Aid, where she single-handedly raised money for artists, freelance artists. And I was one of them, you know, so, and so and I put that back into the work. Like I've just put that back into like, oh, hey, how can we make these books happen? And how can we, you know, I feel like it just always goes back into the work for me. Like I don't, I don't have like a, it's, there's no profit, <laughs> uh, but there is some some month to month sustainability. So I feel like, yeah. And then I've been teaching like gazillions, you know, just personally, I've been teaching, teaching, teaching and, and sustaining that way and, and grateful for those opportunities. Uh, but yeah, I have no idea like what the next six months is going to hold. And so I'm just trying to, you know, hanging on to those credit cards and <laughs> hoping for the best. And, and, you know, I think the funding structures have also really changed because, you know, everybody is asking for the same pot, right? There, we don't have subsidies. So it's like organizations and individual artists are all asking for the, to the same people, basically, to the same philanthropic organizations, to the same foundation. So, so yeah, so it's like, and, and organizations tend to, because of the way our field is structured, um, tend to, to, get those, to get those requests approved first. So, um, so I think that cuts out the freelancers in a big way. Uh, so I think the people that are remembering that there are freelancers in this field, um, is really important. And maybe we need to create new funding structures for, for us that go beyond Kickstarter and GoFundMe and, and other crowdsourcing platforms. But, uh, but yeah, but for now it's like uh, credit cards and, and sort of those, uh, those lovely kind of like grants that have come through. And, and I just can't say enough about Brian and Kimming is doing that. Uh, if you haven't had her on her show, I mean, I just recommend that you interview her because what she did with GigAid was extraordinary. Mm. Yeah, it is stunning seeing how large the population Latina, Latina, Latinx is in New York City, for example, and the languages on the street spoken and how much money gets allocated to the camera. How many stories do we see? How many stories do we hear? How many story? How many artists are represented on the stage? It is uh, it's shocking and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, indefensible how. Um, it is just, there is money around for the arts, but the way it's distributed, perhaps it does not, does not work. It goes to the big, large mm -hmm. institutions who then don't mm -hmm. be the hosts who could be. There's nothing against the big ones, but oh. they have to, and they should be obliged. They will have to go and do their trainings and, and open their doors and have a, a meeting, as you say, of the creative workforce and then existing structures who perhaps um, could be. Um, could be more more there. I know you you are. If I'm right, you are Cuban, Argentine, Spanish, Croatian. So you are a no passport artist, and you have felt, uh, I'm sure, in your life and work, you know, all these invisible uh, walls and structure that are visible to you, perhaps not visible to to us. Are you planning something? Will there be an, a no passport? Um, Zoom uh, gathering. Um, will you? Will there be? Uh, what? What are you planning? If you say, um, I mean, or yeah. helping yet the next generation. You did already so much. I know it's the seal. I think we hosted three years or four years the first conference. Yeah. But, but how much? How long can you really do it? But what? What's? What's on the in the burner at the moment for your community? Uh, in the burner, uh, no password specifically. Just the three books uh, right now because you know that's taking up a lot of time. The um, I did wake up this morning. It's so funny that you asked this. <laughs> I did wake up this morning and I was like, we should do like a no, like a no passport uh, Zoom. Now we can do it, right? Like yeah. <laughs> we have the platform, yeah. we can do it actually. Uh, and so I've, I've, I've been, stra I've been, I sort of, I'm going to get on the bandwagon today because, you know, my, my, my sort of, I get like inspired in the moment and that's how I respond as an artist. But um uh, uh, I was thinking, oh, we should do something in the fall. So I'm, I'm hoping to do something in November, uh, if I can galvanize enough folks to do a Zoom something uh, and a kind of a Zoom conference. Uh, I think that would be really exciting. And also we, we mm -hmm. haven't met um, uh, in, in person, but this is sort of faux in person for a long time. And so I felt like, oh, that would be really cool to actually take the temperature uh, of, the, of the 600 and some colleagues, but also affiliated colleagues around the world. Uh, to see what we can stir up. If anything, just to create an open space to listen to each other uh, would be really remarkable. So, so that's something that's on my mind at the moment for November. And then, 
Yeah, and I, and then I've just been like because I'm still with uh, climate change theater action. Uh, you know, we're still sort of in those conversations uh, with Chantal and and the folks there. And yeah, so it's just been like that. Those are sort of the immediate things that are coming up, as well as my own stuff and getting the film to premiere and <laughs> you know taking care of like business as it were. Um, but yeah, but I'm excited about like doing a, a conference where we can. Re reckon, re right. reckon with what with what we're with the yeah. building, and I'm sure Hal Round could be a host. And you can yeah. see the day when we had the Siegel talk, I made that decision to come back, and we'll support you, of course. And um, but this is, um, you know, no, I think it's a time where we have to take action and re yeah. organize it. But yeah, you did this so much, so much, and I hope there is a, a next generation also that. Um, um, we'll support you and uh, it's inspired by you and, and and put it up. So we're coming closer to towards the end of our session. What is um, what is the um, what is the uh, advice you would give to uh, to um, um, to artists uh, who um, maybe are starting out? The ones who say who do not see their play got cancelled. It's hard enough for you, and but yeah. you know, that's your, this was your first shot and. And uh, Latinx or you know um, African Latino, what what do you what 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 do you say? What should they focus on? And, and on do you say stay in or do you say please really do consider if it's the right thing? What is your advice? Yeah, I mean I think it's different for every person in terms of also uh, fiscal and health security um, or potential security around both of those things. Uh, I feel like it's important to if you believe in this thing you know this is a this is a humble but this is a humble field to begin with you know um so i feel like if you still believe in it try to stick it out if you can um try to keep making try to maybe maybe may work in different ways maybe it's around doing you know local actions uh you know i've always been interested in you know, go to your local laundromat and, and stage theater that way or leave, you know, notes by your friend's door and, and that becomes at a theater action. Um, so, so maybe it's thinking about the artistry in a different way. I mean, a lot of my students were asking me, well, what do I do now? And they were just graduating, literally the class of 2020, right? And so, and they were like, we, we, have, we can't do anything. And I was like, well, yes, you can. You have skills. You have skills around caring and you have skills around nurturing, you have skills around inspiring, you have skills around creativity, which you can use in different ways. And so I feel like maybe that's the time. This is the time to, to test those skills. And, um, and, you know, and I say like for people that feel like, um, you know, they can't stick it out, uh, respect and honor that decision. Uh, you know, it's, it's the nature of, of we're in a pandemic. <laughs> You know, um, but but I hope that I think uh, honoring and trusting the skills that you have that they can be um, put to use, but also inspire others. Uh, and maybe and it's thinking really thinking outside of existing. I do think it's about thinking outside of the existing structures because if you look at the existing structures, um, it may feel hopeless. But actually, you know, I'm a big believer in the wilderness. So I feel like if you if you believe in the wilderness, and if you believe in working from the wilderness, uh, that space can actually free you up, uh, and and you know you can you can create a revolution that way. But it, it'll be probably outside of public view for a long time. Um, but that's actually important. Mm, like that St. Louis company you mentioned that is building an old fashioned wagon and we'll go through yes. the Ozarks and small towns, you think, and yes, exactly. bring their own chairs and sit down, mm -hmm. have a cookout, and then with this thing, we'll, we'll see a medicine show or something. Um, That's right. That's what ha like it happened in the old days. <laughs> mm. So what inspires you at the moment? What do you read? What do you listen to? Um, oh, heavens. I'm reading, I'm reading a lot. Well, I'm going to be writing a book uh soon i should be writing it now um for for around about theater so so i think i've been like a, lo a lot of my reading has revolved around looking at other books in the field and i'm chiefly reading dark theater by alan reed as an inspiration uh which just came out from rutledge so i i feel like it's been my kind of bedside bedside reading as well as work reading um uh and i've been listening to um a lot of podcasts, uh, specifically uh, Chris Good in the UK has been doing this podcast. It's really interesting around experimental <laughs> resistant art. 
mm -hmm. uh, and, and has been posting almost every day, like a, a piece of impossible uh, writer-based resistant uh, art, usually poetry. Uh, and I've been just finding that super inspiring uh, uh, to kind of listen to what feels impossible <laughs> historically. Um, and I've just been reading a lot of Anne, a lot of Anne Boyer because uh, I, I find her immensely inspiring. And so uh, going back to Garments Against Women and, and, and also The Undying, of course, but Garments Against Women specifically has been mm -hmm. really uh, kind of great to, to put back in my consciousness. Um, it's making me want to write. So I'm, so that's a good thing, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that is, that is good. And what do you, li is something you listen to or what do, how do you spend your day? You get up in the morning and you write and eat and write all day. No, I write in the evening. I'm a night owl. I write like at three o'clock in the morning. So, so no, my day is like, part of it is teaching. So I have like a teaching thing in the summer. So teaching. Yeah, which is great. So with us, I'm teaching for, at the moment, I'm teaching with us by primary stages. Uh, so teaching, I get up, I have coffee, I have lots of coffee, <laughs> lots of coffee. Uh, and then I'm, I'm kind of taking notes on the, on my book, uh, and then taking notes on a couple of plays that I want to make, because I've just made four of them in a row. Um, and, uh, and I have to make another one for another theater. So yeah, and then I've just been like, you know, like talking to a lot of artists and and uh, trying to be safe, just trying to be safe uh, health-wise. So so I feel like that's been like at the forefront of everything. Um, and listening to I'm listening to a lot of music. You know, I always listen to music. So so for me, it's like the it feeds my soul in just the best way. And I've just been kind of uh, listening to a lot of jazz and and which might sound pretentious, but it really isn't. <laughs> and uh, and yeah. just kind of like, just trying to, just trying to find um, spaces of peace because the world's so chaotic. And, and I feel like I need to, I think that one of the things that happens in art is that you're, as a maker, you're, there's the reactive mode. There's like, oh, you know, I've got to react to what this happened in the world and that happened in the world. And that can be like useful to a certain degree. Uh, and at the same time, I think it might sometimes can get very damaging because you're only in reactive mode as opposed to listening mode. So I feel like for me, it's like, I went through a reactive phase for like two months and now I'm like, you know what I need to, I need to create a space for myself as, as much as I can to just kind of not be in reactive mode only, but actually, which is hard. It, it, given this administration politically, <laughs> uh, mm. but actually be in a space where I'm writing comes from that lis listening to your heartbeat. It comes from listening to what your body's telling you. It comes from listening to what the ground mm. is telling you and trying to make that reconnection. So I feel like that's where I'm, and music helps me do that. So, so yeah, I find like I reconnect in that way. Yeah, no, that's, um... That's quite something. I can, can only imagine how a writer in New York City alone and publishing, writing and living in that imaginary world and, uh, and uh, finding a, a symbolic meaning in, in, in words and scenes and things one comes up and in a way uh, in solitude where meanwhile theater is such a collaborative act, effort, but writers often, as you pointed out earlier, are used to that. And there's something we, we can learn from them, how to, how to find answers um, um, to this. So um, thank you so much, Caridad, for giving us a little yeah. insight in your world and your thinking yeah. and, uh, and how you experience um, and this moment. And, um, and I hope, you know, that um, also this time will be for, for your community, Latinx community, and everybody also a shot in the arm that will, the significance of it uh, will yeah. be recognized even stronger that uh, your work, life's work uh, will be recognized, but also what you fight for and that it is perhaps at the moment a bit more on the forefront uh, than it was before. And this is a good thing. Next to all yeah. the complications we do experience. Um, we will continue on the SEAL talk series, you know, um, again yeah. next week, we will uh, go um, again around the world and also um, uh, find out uh, what is happening here in New York. We will start with uh, Tony Rock and some of his tap dance friends and see how are they doing. It's such a great American original art form tap dance, a bit undervalued, I do think, but it's a resurgent worldwide. So like yeah. jazz, as you mentioned, it is something that cre that came here and it was a, took influences from so many parts and uh, has a significant um, um, 
uh, uh, impact. And uh, Deborah Mitchell and I see a gray will will join Tony Vark, who runs the Tap Dance Foundation. On Tuesday, we have a significant writer uh, and director, uh, mostly from France, is Philippe. Uh, Cresnier, he is at the Nanterre Amandier Theatre in Paris. It's a great theatre, a big theatre, and to hear what is happening uh, uh, there, Cresnier will, will talk about it in France where things opened up, uh, where now you will have to wear masks uh, inside spaces, but outside they ended the state of emergency. So it's a very, very different experience. And so they must have done um, something uh, right. Betty Chamier will come and uh, talk to us how uh, her experience is of the you know, no, um, US Arab American or Arab American community or American Arab community. However, one will say that, right? Perhaps Ty Jones will join us next week. We'll see, it depends as always on, on uh, many, many things. And then Adelheid Rosen from the Netherlands. Um, who uh, is a very uh, strong uh, also community activist next to, to her work. She got uh, from the League uh, of Professional Women in Theatre the big award, the last one. And uh, so it's interesting to hear what is she doing in the neighborhoods in Amsterdam. And uh, Melanie Joseph uh, will join her from uh, the Foundry and they will talk about uh, how to create a socially engaged, uh, also political art and um, so um, that will be again an interesting, um, interesting lineup. And thanks for HowlRound for um, going with us through another week. And uh, we will go through July full time. Perhaps in August we will slow down a bit, have one cast and podcast a week, and then come back in the fall. But uh, it's been a really eye-opening and helped me personally a lot. And I can only hope that for our listeners, it's also been uh, something in that this is of significance that helps to create meaning to deal with the situation. Artists are closer to the present. They anticipate the future. They are on the right side, as we always say, of social change on the complex struggle for freedom and liberties. And they have been always right. And most of the time, they are always right anyway. So Caridad, thank you for thank joining you. us and good luck with everything. And I hope thank you... you. Uh, we will come out after this and there will be a TAC, the time after Corona, and we have to prepare for it, we have to be ready, but we all, as you said, have to be better. And as you pointed out, structures do not work. My question is, do we evacuate the building? Do we build new ones? Do we modify what's existing? Um, is there something in between? We'll see. Uh, but um, certainly uh, it is a time of change. Something significantly, significantly has changed. But I feel also we are too close. We haven't seen yet what already has happened. So, um, and as someone did say about revolutions, um, things have already happened and then they start. So uh, thank you, Caridad, and all my best. And thank you, all my listeners, uh, for listening, for taking your time. I know how much is going on and more and more uh, is... Uh, um, is uh, on our minds and uh, so it uh, means a great deal to us to have you with us so thank you to our listeners and uh, and listen to, to what our artists said bye bye thank you Carida. bye bye and thanks to HowlRound Travis and uh, VJ and Thea and the Seagull team Andy and Sanya bye bye